Introduction to Selected Poetry on or About the Maclean's. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Poetry on or About the Maclean's, compiled by John Patterson Maclean. Introduction Gifted with poesy, as are the Highlanders, and given to the praise of their country and their leaders, it would be expected that many poems would still be extant concerning the Maclean's and their ancestral dominions. To present this question properly requires a wide acquaintance with Gaelic poetry, both published and unpublished manuscripts. The probability is that the greater part of this literature has never been published. In Rev. A. Maclean Sinclair's manuscript collection, entitled Clairsuch non Alanian, are sixty-six poems either by or else about the Maclean's, only seven of which have ever been in print. I find others exist in volumes which I do not have access to. I enumerate the following known to me. First, from the Glenbard collection published in 1888. This contains two by Ian Lom, eleven by Ian Macalane, five by Mary Nine Lacarm, one by Mary Nickfail, and one by Domnal McGillamar. Ian Lom, or John MacDonald, born about 1620 and died in 1709, was one of the most celebrated of Gaelic poets. His poems are numerous, but have never been published in a collected form. On page 18 is his poem on Sir Lachlan MacLean, first baronet of Duart, containing fifteen verses of three lines each, followed on page 20 by one on MacLean of Duart of twelve verses, each also containing three lines. This appears to have been composed when Brolus was guardian of Sir John. It mentions Sir Lachlan Moore, Hector Roy, and MacLean of Brolus. This poem also occurs in Clarsec Nicali on page 244. Of the poems of Ian MacLean, given under notices of the poets, the first occurs on page 55 and is on Sir John MacLean of Duart. It contains six verses of four lines each. This is followed by another on Sir John, page 57, of nineteen verses of four lines each, followed immediately by two others on Sir John, one containing eleven verses of eight lines each, and the other fifteen verses of seven lines each. The next is the Battle of Alford, a dialogue of seventeen verses of four lines each. This is founded on a six-week session of a court of justice held at Arras, Mall. The following Maclean's figure in the poem. Murdoch Og of Lochbuie, Donald of Call, MacLean of Brolis, Doidum Dana of Ardgower, and Lachlan of Calgary. On page 89, 32 lines of the poem on Colonel Charles MacLean of Drimnan, who fell at Culloden, are given. It is found in Stuart's Highland Bards and in Beauties of Gaelic Poetry. This is followed by three more on Charles of Drimnan, the first containing six verses of eight lines each, the second, five verses of eight lines each, and the last, page ninety-seven, eight lines. On page 101 is a poem of three verses of eight lines on the blessing of a house, which belonged to a Maclean who is called the grandson of Charles, the son of Allan. On page 102 is a poem of sixteen verses entitled The Migration of Maclean of Tresnish. Mayreed, mentioned among the poets on page 105, has a lament of twenty verses of eight lines each on Allan, brother of Donald, third MacLean of Brolus. This Allan was an officer in the army and died in Stirling in 1722. The next, page 110, is a lament for Lachlan MacLean containing eleven verses of five lines each. Just who this Lachlan is, the poem does not clearly reveal. This is followed by two poems on Sir John and one on Sir Allan MacLean. The first, page 112, contains nine verses of four lines each, the second six verses of eight lines each, and the third eight of four lines each. Mary MacPhail, or Mary MacPhail, whose history I am ignorant of, on page 117 has a lament on Hector MacLean, consisting of nine verses of five lines each. The poem does not reveal what Hector this was. Domnal McGillamore, or Donald Morrison, appears to have been a native of Call, but lived in Tyree. On page 119 he has a poem of thirteen verses of three lines each on Hector, eleventh MacLean of Call. The second book of poems is called Clairsach Nakali and contains thirteen by Ambard Magillian, one by Aiken Bacock, one by Marid Nain Lacain, one by Andra Mac and Eesbuig, one by Domnal Ban Magillian, 
one by Aiken MacLean, two by Catriona Nick Gillian, one by Aganach, one by Neil MacLauman, one by Gillespuig MacGillian, one by Alistair MacGionhum, one by Domnal MacGillian, one by E.M. Camshrun, and one by Alistair MacDumnall. Ambard MacGillian, or John MacLean, is duly noticed in the chapter on poets. The book opens with a poem of eighteen verses of eight lines each on Alexander, fourteenth MacLean of Call, followed on pages 119 and 125 by two more, one of twenty-one verses of eight lines each and the other twenty-two of eight lines each. To these must be added five more ascribed to the Laird of Call. The first page seven has twelve verses of eight lines each, the second page eleven the same. The third page fifteen, seventeen of eight lines each, the fourth page twenty, ten of seven lines each, and the last page twenty-three contains eleven verses of seven lines each. We also have two poems addressed to the younger Laird of Call, which was Hugh fifteenth. The first, page twenty-six, contains eleven verses of eight lines each, and the other page thirty, eleven of sixteen lines each. On page 40 is a sonnet of 14 verses of four lines each addressed to Rev. John MacLean of Call. Page 53 is a poem on the loss of Neil MacLean, who was drowned in 1809. It contains 15 verses of eight lines each. The Lament on Archibald MacLean of Scour, page 81, contains 13 verses of eight lines each. Aiken Bacock, or Hector MacLean, the poet to Sir Lachlan of Duart, has been mentioned under poets. His Song to Sir Lachlan, page 193, contains fourteen verses of three lines. Married Nine Lachane has a song of eleven verses of six lines each dedicated to Sir John MacLean. It occurs on page 204. Domnal Ban Magillian, or Donald MacLean the Fair-Haired, was a poet of Maul. His song, page 207 on Donald, third MacLean of Brolas, contains seventeen verses of six lines each. Aiken MacLean, or Hector son of John, or Hector fourth MacLean of Call, had the honor of composing what afterward proved to be the Song of the MacLeans. It is entitled The War Song of Alan Nansalt. It is composed of twelve verses of four lines each. See page 215. Catriona Nagillian, or Catherine MacLean, mentioned under poets, composed a song to Lachlan eighth MacLean of Call. It contains, page 217, seven verses of eight lines each. Aganach, called in Gilly's collection Nine Domnal Gurm, composed a poem, page 223, of twelve verses of eight lines each, on Donald, tenth MacLean of Call. Neil MacLamoon, or Neil Lamont, was a native of Tyree. When the Montgomery Highlanders went to America in 1757, he composed, page 233, a song to Sir Alan MacLean. It contains nine verses of three lines each. Gillespuig MacLean, or Archibald MacLean, previously noticed, composed page 238, a song of ten verses of seven lines each on Archibald MacLean of Kilmalog. Alistair MacLumeen, or Alexander MacKinnon, born in 1770 and died in 1814, addressed a song, page 257, to the noble of the clan Gillian. It contains nine verses of four lines each. Domnal MacGillian, or Donald MacLean, has a song, page 258, of thirteen verses of four lines each, addressed to Dr. Alan MacLean of the Ross of Maul. Ian Camshrun, or John Cameron, who died in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, in 1858, inscribes an elegy, page 231, of fourteen verses of seven lines each, to M. Bard MacGillian, or John MacLean, the poet. Alexander MacDonald, a native of Moidart but living in Antigonish, also writes an elegy to Ambard MacGillian. It contains, page 335, eight verses of eight lines each. Mackenzie's Beauties of Gaelic Poetry in two volumes was published in 1841 and 1845. It contains one by E.M. Dub MacEam Icalane, three by Aiken Bacock, one by Ian MacElaine, and one by Callum McGlean. Ian Dub MacLean Icalane, or John MacDonald, was of the Clan Ronald family and born about the year 1665. His elegy on Sir John MacLean, page 70, is partly given, viz., 15 verses of 16 lines each. 
Eakin Bacock, or Hector MacLean above mentioned, has three poems. The first, page 77, an elegy on Sir Lachlan MacLean of 18 verses and 137 lines. The verses contain eight, seven, and six lines. This poem attracted the attention of Sir Walter Scott, who published a free translation of it. A Song to Lachlan Og, page 79, of eleven verses of eight lines each. The last, page 386, is put down as anonymous. It is an elegy on the death of Sir Hector Roy MacLean, composed of fourteen verses of eight lines each. Callum Glynn, or Malcolm MacLean, noticed under poets, composed a song, page 365, of nine verses of eight lines each, on his daughter, whom he calls his Nain Dub Thogorak. This has been put into English by Professor Blackie and given as number eight of this note. In many Gaelic poems not devoted to the MacLeans, reference is made to the Clan Gillian. To hunt these up and make particular reference to them would result in no particular advantage. Those which have been translated into English may be of some interest. Some of these are contained in Hogg's Jacobite Relics in two volumes published in 1874. In the first volume are five references. In Song Two, the Halls of Cromdale, composed of sixteen verses, the thirteenth is as follows. MacLean's, MacDougall's, and MacNeil's so boldly as they took the field and made their enemies to yield upon the haws of Cromdale. Song 16. Three good fellows a yon yon glen contains five verses, the fourth being, Their skies noble chieftain, Hector and bold Evan, Reoc, Bain, Macrabuck, and the true MacLean. Song 17. The Battle of Killiecrankie contains seven verses, the fifth as follows. Sir Evan Dew and his men true came linking up the brink man. The Hogan Dutch, they feared such, they bred a horrid stink then. The true MacLean and his fierce men came in among them a man. Nain durst withstand his heavy hand, ah fled and ran awa then. Song 90, the Chevalier's Muster Roll, contains five verses, the second being, Borland and his men's coming, Cameron and MacLean's coming, Gordon and MacGregor's coming, Ilka Dunnywassel's coming, Little Watchy was coming, McGillivray's and Oz coming. In Volume 2 or Second Series of Jacobite Relics, Song 108, On the Restoration of the Forfeited Estates, contains six verses. The fourth reads, MacLeod MacDonald joined the strain, MacPherson, Fraser, and MacLean. Though all your bounds let gladness reign, both prince and patriot praising whose generous bounty richly pours the streams of plenty round your shores to scotch's hills their pride restores her faded honours raising sir walter scott in his lord of the isles makes mention of the MacLeans. in canto one in section fifteen we read full many a shrill triumphant note saline and scholastal bade float their misty shores around and Morvern's echoes answered well, and Dewart heard the distant swell come down the darksome sound. In that scene so terrifically portrayed in Canto two, sections 16 and 17, when the attempted assault is made in Ard Tornish Castle by the Lord of Lorne and mainland chiefs upon Bruce, among those who rally to the defense of the latter is the Lord of Dewart, brave Torquil from Dunvegan High, Lord of the misty hills of sky, MacNeil, wild Barra's ancient thane, Dewart of bold Clan Gillian strain, Fergus of Canna's castled bay, MacDuffeth, Lord of Collinsay. As soon as they saw the broad sword's glance with ready weapons rose at once, more prompt than many an ancient feud, full oft suppressed, full oft renewed, glowed twixt the chieftains of Argyle and many a lord of Ocean's Isle. Again in Canto Four, Section Nine, they left Loch Twa on their lee, and they waked the men of the wild Tyree and the chief of the Sandy Call. Loch Bui's fierce and warlike lord, their signal saw, and grasped his sword. End of introduction. Recording by Philip Gould. The Isle of Mull by Dugald MacPhail. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. Oh, the island of Mull is an isle of delight, with the wave on the shore and the sun on the height, with the breeze on the hills and the blast on the bends, and the old green woods and the old grassy glens.
though exiled i live from the land of my race in newcastle a grey and grimy old place my heart thou fair island is ever with thee and thy beautiful bends with their roots in the sea o oh, the island of mull is an isle of delight with the wave on the shore and the sun on the height with the breeze on the hills and the blast on the bends and the old green woods and the old grassy glens there was health in thy breeze and the breath of thy flowers was fragrant and fresh need the light summer showers when i wandered a boy unencumbered and free at the base of the bend neath the old holly tree o oh, the island of mull is an isle of delight with the wave on the shore and the sun on the height with the breeze on the hills and the blast on the bends and the old green woods and the old grassy glens where the lusa was swirling in deep rocky bed there the white-bellied salmon with spots of the red and veins of dark blue and young lustihood strong was darting and leaping and frisking along o oh, the island of mull is an isle of delight with the wave on the shore and the sun on the height with the breeze on the hills and the blast on the bends and the old green woods and the old grassy glens and a deft-handed youth there would gallantly stand with a triple-pronged spear smooth and sharp in his hand and swiftly he pounced like a hawk on his prey and glancing and big on the bank there it lay oh the island of mull is an isle of delight with the wave on the shore and the sun on the height with the breeze on the hills and the blast on the bends and the old green woods and the old grassy glens and the red hen was there neath the wood's leafy pride and the cock he was crooning and cooing beside and though forest or fence there was none on the bend the red deer were trooping far up in the glen oh the island of mull is an isle of delight with the wave on the shore and the sun on the height with the breeze on the hills and the blast on the bends and the old green woods and the old grassy glens oh then twas my joy in the pride of the may to list to the sweet-throated birds on the spray and to brush the cool dew from the low winding glen when the first ray of morning streamed down from the bend oh the island of mull is an isle of delight with the wave on the shore and the sun on the height with the breeze on the hills and the blast on the bends and the old green woods and the old grassy glens bright joys of my youth ye are gone like a dream like a bubble that burst on the breast of the stream but my blessing fair mull shall be constant with thee and thy green mantled bends with their roots in the sea o oh, the island of mull is an isle of delight with the wave on the shore and the sun on the height with the breeze on the hills and the blast on the bends and the old green woods and the old grassy glens end of poem this recording is in the public domain the last harper of mull by tannahill Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. When Rosie was faithful, how happy was I! Still gladsome as summer, the time glided by. I played my harp cheery while fondly I sang of the charms of my Rosie, the winter nicks lang. But now I'm as wayful as wayful can be. Come simmer, come winter, it's all ain to me. For the dark gloom of falsehood say clouds my sad soul, but cheerless for I is the harper of mall. I wander the glens and the wild woods alone, in their deepest recesses I make my sad moan. My harp's mournful melody joins in the strain, while sadly I sing of the days that are gain. Though Rosie is faithless, she's no the less fair, and the thought of her beauty but feeds my despair. With painful remembrance my bosom is full and weary a life is the harper of mall as slumbering i lay by the dark mountain stream my lovely young rosie appeared in my dream i thought her still kind and i ne'er was say blessed as in fancy i clasped the dear nymph to my breast thou false fleeting vision too soon thou wert o'er thou wakest me to tortures unequalled before but death's silent slumbers my grief soon shall lull and the green grass wave o'er the harper of mall End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chieftain MacLean by Evan McCall. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. Up bonnet and feather, up thistle and heather, St. Andrew's good advent is on us again. 
what Scotsman revering in its memories endearing would not make a night out with Chieftain MacLean. When Noah turned seaman, most people agree, man, MacLean of that day had a boat of his ain. A clansman less famous, though every inch game, is our own gallant chieftain, the other MacLean. A bonnet and feather, up thistle and heather, St. Andrew's good advent is on us again. What Scotsman revering in its memories endearing would not make a night out with chieftain MacLean. Away with your grumblers, whom nothing but tumblers of punch and a haggis contempt to fall in. The fair happy faces that here fill their places most proud of by far must be Chieftain MacLean. A bonnet and feather, up thistle and heather, St. Andrew's good advent is on us again. What Scotsman revering in its memories endearing would not make a night out with Chieftain MacLean. Old Scotland's grand story, so pregnant of glory, the ballads that cheered her in days that have been, her songs so heart-touching, all hearers bewitching, oh, who would not feast on with Chieftain MacLean? Up bonnet and feather, up thistle and heather, St. Andrew's good advent is on us again. What Scotsman revering in its memories endearing would not make a night out with Chieftain MacLean? From Ossian and Selma to Lucknow and Alma, such triumphs are linked to the war-pipe's proud strain, that fellows who'd hear it, its music to sneer at, had best shun the sight of our Chieftain MacLean. Up bonnet and feather, up thistle and heather, St. Andrew's good advent is on us again. What Scotsman revering in its memories endearing would not make a night out with Chieftain MacLean. Let pinks of perfection themselves verily vexing, a good Scottish reel call a pastime profane. The worst I wish for them would be Tullock Gorham to dance till they sweated with Chieftain MacLean. Up bonnet and feather, up thistle and heather, St. Andrew's good advent is on us again. What Scotsman revering in its memories endearing would not make a night out with Chieftain MacLean. O oh, Scotland, dear Scotland, alas, there's not land enough in thy bounds all thy sons to contain. Else not this far west one, but thine own dear breast on our joys would be perfect with Chieftain MacLean. Up bonnet and feather, up thistle and heather, St. Andrew's good advent is on us again. What Scotsman revering in its memories endearing would not make a night out with Chieftain MacLean. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. MacLean's Child, A Legend of Lochbuie. Author Unknown. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. The sun rose fair on distant mull where ocean heaves its billows high. And o'er Loch Bui, the white seagull, winged its way tween wave and sky, the wild pipes uttered their pibroch shrill, and clansmen came from hut and heather, with belted kilt and waving feather, to chase the deer on the misty hill. MacLean was there with his haughty bride, and his only boy in his nurse's arms, and the chieftain looked with love and pride on his infant hope and his lady's charms. And now, he cried, thou'lt see what cheer MacLean's dark hills can yield thee here. We'll touch not now the timorous hare that croucheth low in the shady glen, nor whistling plover, nor bonny moor hen, but stir the fawn from its dewy lair and drive in herds the antlered deer. And straight his clansmen round were spread, or fleet like winds of winter sped, the ground to beat both far and near and drive together the startled deer, where the chieftain's lady with ease might trace the gathering herds and headlong chase. Young Ian, the pride of his native glen, the love of maids and boast of men, was placed alone to guard with care a pass that oped a refuge where the deer might scape the waiting fair. They came and swept the youth away as a tempest scatters the foaming spray. An angry man, MacLean was then, as he saw the fleet herd pass the glen, and the youth came on with head hung low, with shame, but not with fear, I trow. Go! Seize the dog, the chieftain said, and tear the plume from his dastard head. Strip his coward shoulders bare, why should the tartan flutter there? Go quickly, bind and scourge the wretch, we'll see what blood the rod can fetch, or whether his mother's milk in part still lingers about his childish heart. No words they spoke, but stifled sighs might tell what dimmed the clansman's eyes, and why a shudder went round and round as the lash fell on the deepening wound. No shriek, nor groan, nor stifled sigh was heard to come from Ian's breast. No tear was seen in his fiery eye, but pale his cheeks with the chill of death. 
His eyeballs strained, and his lips compressed, and his nostrils bled with his laboring breath. At length the scourge away is cast, the thongs are cut that bound him fast, and Ian started bleeding there, and wildly seized the chieftain's heir. And fast away to a cliff he sped that far o'er the boiling billows hung, and he waved the infant high o'erhead and laughed till the rocks around him rung. Oh, wildly looked the chieftain then, as shriek and shout filled all the glen, and with clasped hands and bended knee he cried, O oh, save my only child! While Ian danced and shrieking wild answered thus with fiendish glee, Come, strip thy back and let me see the wolfish blood that flows in thee, and then thy gory arms may hold the infant chief that crows so bold. The chieftain stripped, and the red drops fell, for the clansmen urged the strokes full well. And now, he cried, my infant give, and thou, I swear, in peace shall live. Aha! he shrieked, go, get thee now, and see in every clouded brow a blushing friend or a biting foe, or follow thy boy to hide thy name, and wash thy back and brow from shame in the boiling waves where now we go. And away he sprung, still laughing wild, the bleeding youth with his chieftain's child. They rushed to the brink of the rocky steep, but the sea had covered its bosom deep. And they heard but the sound of the billows sweep, and they seemed to lull their charge asleep. And the sailors still, as they passed the shore with shuddering look on cliff and sea, and tell how oft when the wild winds roar, and their boats on the foaming billows flee. An infant's wail they seemed to hear, or loud and shrill on the startled sea, the clansman's shriek and fiendish glee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. MacLean's Child by Charles Mackay. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. McLean, you've scourged me like a hound. You should have struck me to the ground. You should have played a chieftain's part. You should have stabbed me to the heart. You should have crushed me into death. But here I swear with living breath that for this wrong which you have done I'll wreak my vengeance on your son. On him, and you, and all your race, he said. And bounding from his place, he seized the child with sudden hold, a smiling infant three years old. And starting like a hunted stag, he scaled the rocks, he clomb the crag, and reached o'er many a wide abyss the beetling seaward precipice. And leaning o'er its topmost ledge, he held the infant o'er the edge. In vain thy wrath, in vain thy wrath, thy sorrow vain, no hand shall save it, proud MacLean. With flashing eye and burning brow the mother followed, heedless how, or crags with mosses overgrown, and stair-like juts of slippery stone. But midway up the rugged steep she found a chasm she could not leap, and kneeling on its brink she raised her supplicating hands, and gazed. O oh, spare my child, my joy, my pride, O oh, give me back my child, she cried. My child, my child, with sobs and tears, she shrieked upon his callous ears. Come, Evan, said the trembling chief, his bosom wrung with pride and grief. Restore the boy, give back my son, and I'll forgive the wrong you've done. I scorn forgiveness, haughty man, you've injured me before the clan, and naught but blood shall wipe away the shame I have endured to-day. And as he spoke, he raised the child to dash it mid the breakers wild. But at the mother's piercing cry drew back a step, and made reply. Fair lady, if your lord will strip and let a clansman wield the whip, till skin shall flay and blood shall run, I'll give you back your little son. The lady's cheeks grew pale with ire, the chieftain's eyes flashed sudden fire. He drew a pistol from his breast, took aim, then dropped it sore distressed. I might have slain my babe instead. Come, Evan, come, the father said, and through his heart a tremor ran. We'll fight our quarrel man to man. Wrong unavenged I've never borne, said Evan, speaking loud in scorn. You've heard my answer, proud MacLean. I will not fight you. Think again. 
the lady stood in mute despair with freezing blood and stiffening hair she moved no limb she spoke no word she could but look upon her lord he saw the quivering of her eye pale lips and speechless agony and doing battle with his pride give back the boy i yield he cried a storm of passion shook his mind anger and shame and love combined but love prevailed and bending low he bared his shoulders to the blow i smite you said the clansman true forgive me chief the deed i do for by yon heaven that hears me speak my dirk in evan's heart shall reek but evan's face beamed hate and joy close to his breast he hugged the boy revenge is just revenge is sweet and mine loch buoy shall be complete ere hand could stir with sudden shock he threw the infant o'er the rock then followed with a desperate leap down fifty fathoms to the deep they found their bodies in the tide and never till the day she died was that sad mother known to smile the niobe of mullah's isle they dragged false evan from the sea and hanged him on a gallows tree and ravens fattened on his brain to sate the vengeance of MacLean. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wild Revenge by Thomas Nimmo. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. Tis morning, or Hebridean isles which dot the surface of the deep, the orb of day returning smiles. The spirits of the water sleep. O oh, sweets the breath of early morn, And bright the glow of eastern sky, And fair the flowers whose tents adorn Mull's wild and rugged scenery. But brighter far than nature's eye Is woman's pure and pensive eye While watching through the dreary night The innocence of infancy. And fairer than the fairest flower That decks the mead or mountain wild Are smiles which in a mother's bower Play o'er the features of her child. The matins in Lockbuoy's halls are said. MacLean, the doughty chief, with haughty mien his henchman calls, and gives command in language brief. Go, let the pibroch of the clan, the gathering, both loud and clear, be sounded from the bartizan. MacLean today will hunt the deer. His child, Lockbuoy's son and heir, his wife, the Lady Isabel, will with himself be present there. Hence, Quickly go, thy message tell. The henchmen sped, the staghounds bay, the fiery steeds impatient rear. The vassals in their tartan gay with gladsome faces soon appear. The chief with bow and bugle horn rides foremost with his island queen. The nurse and child aloft are borne within their wicker palanquin. The thrilling bagpipes gaily play as from their drones the streamers fly, the merry clansmen bound away and shout in wildest ecstasy. And now they reach the forest green of pine trees with their scaly cone, where turning round the proud MacLean keen marks his followers, every one. Each gorge and pass he fenced with care and strictest vigilance enjoined in order that the quarry there no outlet for escape might find. Twelve men of might and stature tall, well armed with lance and studded shield, form quickly at their chieftain's call to tend their lady on the field. A little higher ground to gain they onward moved, and many a prayer is muttered as they cross the plain, for Isabel so bland and fair. The bugles sound, the startled deer fly fleetly as the viewless wind, the shaggy hounds in full career pursue, and leave the woods behind. The bowmen with their weapon bent concealed behind the rocks remain, with sinews braced and eyes intent to lance the barb with deadly aim. But quicker still the red deer flew, the warder shouts were given in vain, as nearer to the pass they drew their course to change or speed restrain. With bounding spring and antlers reared in air this furious rush, anon the hard and narrow gorge they've cleared, the hunting of that day is done. Exerted hope can rarely brook the sting of disappointment keen, so told the dark and angry look and flashing eye of proud MacLean. Seize, bind the slave, he madly cried, a cur-dog's death his doom shall be, all hope of mercy is denied. Diavol, 
bang him on the nearest tree. But no, a refuge in the grave from sneering scorn the coward finds, misfortune's bitter blast to brave belongs alone to noble minds. So let him live. The knotted lash instead of death his flesh shall tear, till blood spurt out from every gash which stains his craven shoulders bare. With lips compressed and dauntless breast the gale his stripes unflinching bore. No chains of countenance confess the pain that thrilled through every pore. Enough, the chieftain called aloud. The victim's cords were quick untied, and slowly, followed by the crowd, Lochbuie to meet his lady hide. Like sunbeam peering o'er the fells through musky clouds which sudden roll, she sweetly smiles, and soon dispels the moody umbrage of his soul. With kindly glow his bosom warms, and stooping low upon the plain, he raised the infant in his arms, and kissed him o'er and o'er again. As if by force of magic's power the clansmen in their transports wild join in the greetings of the hour, and bless the lady and her child. The cheetah in the jungle trail creeps stealthily forward as he goes, and if observed he sweeps his tail, and clouds of dust around him throws. As thus concealed he crouching lies. The doe no longer looks behind, relieved from dread of all surprise. She feeds, and thinks twas but the wind. But creeping nearer with a bound the cheetah fixes on his prey, which felling on the tangled ground he paws and tears with savage play. So Callum do with felon aim his direful purpose to conceal, shouts with the crowd in loud acclaim as if disgrace he could not feel. But, sudden as the lightning's flash, he from the nurse the child has torn, and up the cliff with frenzied dash the infant on his arm has borne. He never stopped, till clamoring high the fearful peak at last he gained, and thence he scowled with glaring eye on those who far below remained. He quickly drew his dagger-blade, and o'er his heart he placed the child. He wrapped it in his tartan plaid, and stood erect, and grimly smiled. The chief was powerless and appalled. The pale and frenzied Isabel wild shrieked, and for her infant called, as prostrate on the earth she fell. Seemed as if wakening from a trance, t'was only then the clansman knew by instinct, or by dint of chance, the vengeful act of Callum Dhu. Infuriate, maddened, forth they bound to scale the steep and narrow path which up the cliff so slippery wound, from which to swerve were certain death. Move but a step, he hoarsely cried, and on this dagger's hilt I swear its blade shall red in blood be dyed of innocence. Take heed. Beware. The chieftain with uplifted hands looks heavenward on the voiceless sky, and tremblingly imploring stands, rack torn with fiercest agony. One half my lands I'll freely give, all, all, he cried in accents wild, so that the innocent may live. O oh, save my wife, and spare my child. Lochbuie Gallum Dhu replied, Gold can never indemnify for loss of honor, nor can hide the stains of open infamy. Me wantonly you have disgraced, I me. Although full well you knew your confidence was ne'er misplaced when given in trust to Gallum Dhu. To me your life you once have owed, and opening his checkered vest, he with his finger proudly showed a cicatrice upon his breast. To you your angel wife is dear, to me more dear than life and light is Flora, who with soul sincere her maiden troth to me did plight. And am I then so abject now as not to dare her smiles to greet? Yes, I absolve her from her vow, revenge alone to me is sweet. Yet listen, if on bended knee you do now publicly confess how deeply you have injured me in sorrow and regret express, and farther, if you shall consent to bear your shoulders to the scourge and suffer what I underwent, these, these perhaps the stain may purge. Yes, yes, thy purpose to recall I here confess on bended knee, in presence of my vassals all, that I have deeply injured thee. Stripes, torture, death itself, I dare, exclaimed aloud the stricken chief, so that my only child you spare, and thus assuage his mother's grief. 
the astonished clansmen murmured loud but quailed as them their chief denied who in the centre of the crowd the agonizing lash defied twas over though he could not speak he breathing deep looked wistfully toward the cold and dreary peak which topped the rugged cliff so high oh horror with outstretched arm the desperate man held up the child as if he meditated harm his looks were haggard dark and wild one moment more with demon glare he bent his arm the child to kiss then vaulting into empty air both sank into the dark abyss oh who can paint a scene so dread the howling and the dismal yell enough to rouse the sleeping dead and scare the very fiends of hell but whence those other sounds of woe which now assail the wearied ear so mournful plaintive wailing low like moaning winds in autumn sere has some illusion of the mind some airy phantom of the brain a dream of fancy undefined awakened up such doleful strains ah no the accents sad of grief the passing knell have mournful knoll and warned the childless widowed chief that isabel in death lies cold how vain alas is human pride in youth impatient of control it swells like ocean's raging tide and saps the barriers of the soul in after years as death draws near its waves begin to retrograde while we lament with many a tear and mourn the mocks which they have made the morn had seen loch buoy proud ride forth the idol of his clan the evening hears him sob aloud alone and broken-hearted man for closed in dullness is that ear which mercy never sued in vain and dims that eye which wont to cheer and make the wretch forget his pain no longer shall the infant gem of innocence endearing smile cut off before its beauteous stem it sleeps beside mull's mournful isle poor flora in fantastic weeds wild wanders on the lonely shore and muttering mournful tells her beads she ne'er shall see her callum more loch buoy's halls are silent now within iona's cloistered pile the chief to heaven his life did vow and never more was seen to smile end of poem this recording is in the public domain mclean's child by john george edward henry douglas sutherland campbell the marquis of lorne part one dark with shrouds of mist surrounded rise the mountains from the shore where the galleys of the islemen stand up drawn their voyage o'er horns this morn are hoarsely sounding from loch buoy's ancient wall while for chase the guests and vassals gather in the court and hall hounds whose voices could give warning from far moors of stags it lay quiver in each iron muscle howl impatient of delay henchmen waiting for the signal at their chief's imperious word start to drive from hill and quarry to the pass the watchful herd closed were paths as with a netting vain high courage speed or scent every mesh a man in ambush ready with a crossbow bent Aiken, guard that glen and copsewood at your peril let none by cries the chief while in the heather silently the huntsmen lie shouting by the green morasses where the fairies dance at night yelling neath the oak and birches come the beaters into sight and before them rushing wildly speeds the driven herd of deer whose wide antlers tossed like branches in the winter of the year useless was the vassal's effort to arrest the living flow and it passed by Aiken's passage spite of hound and shout and blow worse than woman useless caitiff why allowed you them to pass back no answer hark men hither take his staff and bind him fast hearing was with them obeying and the hunter's strong limbs lie bound with thongs from tawny oxen neath the chieftain's cruel eye more than two score stags have passed him mark the number on his flesh with red stripes of this good ashwood mend me thus this broken mesh ah loch buoy faint and sullen beats the heart once leal and free that had yielded life exulting if it bled for thine and thee 
Deem'st thou that no honour liveth save in haughty hearts like thine? Think'st thou men like dogs in spirit at such blows but wince and whine? Often in the dangerous tempest when the winds before the blast surging charge like crested horsemen over helm and plank and mast, he and all his kin before him well have kept the clansman's faith, serving thee in every danger, shielding thee from harm and scathe. Mid the glens and hills in combat, where the blades of swordsmen meet, has he fought with the Campbells, mingling glory with defeat. But as waters round Aorsa, dark and deep, then blanch in foam, when the wind, been more his harbored, burst in thunder from their home, so the brow, fear never clouded, blackens now neath anger's pall, and the lips to speak disdaining, white at revenge's call. Part two. Late, when many years had passed him and the chief's old age begun, seemed his youth again to blossom with the birth of his fair son. Late, when all his days had hardened into flint his nature wild, seemed it softer grown and kinder for the sake of that one child. And again a hunting morning saw Loch Bui and his men, with his boy, his guests, and kinsmen hidden o'er a coppiced glen. Deep within its open thickets ran its waters to the sea. On the hill the chief lay careless while the child watched eagerly. Neath them, on the shining ocean, island beyond island lay, where the peaks of Jura's bosom rose or holy Orense, where the greener fields of Islay pointed to the far Kintyre, fruitful lands of after ages wasted then with sword and fire. For the spell that once had gathered all the chiefs beneath the sway of the ancient royal scepter of the isles had passed away. Once from Rathline to the southward, westward to the low Tyree, northward past the Alps of Coolin, summer-led ruled land and sea. Colin say Lismore and Scarba, Butte and Cumray, Mull and Sky, Erin, Jura, Luz and Islay shouted then one battle cry. But those isles that still united, taught at Harlaw Scotland's might, broken by their fierce contentions, singly waged disastrous fight. And the teaching of forgiveness Grey Iona's creed became, not a sign for men to reverence, but a burning brand of shame. Still among the names that ruin had not numbered in her train lived the great clan, proud as ever of the race of strong MacLean. And his boy, like her he wedded, though of nature like the dove, showed the eagle spirit flashing through a heritage of love. Heir of all the vassal's homage, rendered to the grisly sire, he had grown his people's treasure, fostered as their heart's desire. Surely safety guards his footsteps, enmity he hath not shown. Yet who stealthily glides near him, who's the arm around him thrown? It is Achan, who his wolf-like seized upon a helpless prey. Fearless and fast he bears him where the cliff o'erhangs the bay. There, while sea-birds scream around them, holding by his throat the boy, Achan turns, and to the father shouts in scorn and mocking joy. Take the punishment thou gavest, give before all there a pledge for my freedom, or thy darling dying falls from yonder ledge. Take the strokes in even number as thou gavest, blow for blow, then dishonored on thine honor, swear to let me freely go. Silent in his powerless anger stood the chief with all his folk, and before them all the ransom was exacted, stroke for stroke. Then again the voice of vengeance pealed from Achan's lips in hate. Childless and dishonored villain, expiation comes too late. My revenge is not completed, and they saw in dumb despair how he hurled his victim downward headlong through the empty air. Then they heard a yell of laughter as they turned away the eye, and they gazed again where nothing met their sight but cliff and sky. For the murderer dared to follow where the youthful spirit fled to the throne of the avenger, to the judge of quick and dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Callum of the Glen by Malcolm MacLean. 
My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty. Fair daughter, whom none had the sense yet to marry, And I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, My bonny dark maid. For sure thou art beautiful, faultless to see, No malice can fashion a blot upon thee. Thy bosom's soft whiteness the seagull may shame, And for thou art lordless, tis I am to blame. My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty. Fair daughter, whom none had the sense yet to marry, And I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, My bonny dark maid. And indeed I am sorry, my fault I deplore, Who won thee no tocture by swelling my store, With drinking and drinking my tin slipped away, And so there's small boast of my sporin to-day. My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty, Fair daughter, whom none had the sense yet to marry, And I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, My bonny dark maid. While I sit at the board well seasoned with drinking, And wish for the thing that lies nearest my thinking, Tis the little brown jug that my eye will detain, And when once I have seen it, I'd see it again. My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty, For a daughter whom none had the sense yet to marry, And I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, My bonny dark maid. The men of the country may jeer and may jibe that I rank with the penniless beggarly tribe, but though few are my cattle I'll still find a way for a drop in my bottle till I'm under the clay. My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty, fair daughter whom none had the sense yet to marry, and I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, my bonny dark maid. There's a grumpy old fellow as proud as a king, whose lambs will be dying by scores in the spring, drinks three bottles a year, most sober of men, but dies a poor sinner like Callum Glen. My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty, fair daughter whom none had the sense yet to marry, and I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, my bonny dark maid. When I'm at the market with a dozen like me, of proper good fellows that love barley brie, I sit round the table and drink without fear, for my good wife says only, God bless you, my dear. My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty, fair daughter whom none had the sense yet to marry, and I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, my bonny dark maid. Though I'm poor, what of that, I can live and not steal, though pinched at a time by the high price of meal. There's good luck with God, and He gives without measure, and while He gives health, I can pay for my pleasure. My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty, fair daughter whom none had the sense yet to marry, and I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, my bonny dark maid. Very true that my drink makes my money go quicker, yet I'll not take a vow to dispense with good liquor. In my own liquid way I'd be great among men, now you know what to think of good Callum Glen. My bonny dark maid, my precious, my pretty, I'll sing in your praise a light-hearted ditty, fair daughter whom none had the sense yet to marry, and I'll tell you the cause why their love did miscarry, my bonny dark maid. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Inish Choinish by Professor John Stuart Blackie Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould Nay, spur not so. He wastes no time who tarries a moment here to spell the old grey stones, where high renowned Macleans and stout Macquarries rehearse their glories and preserve their bones. Here think thee back a thousand years or more, and ask how tonsured monks were mighty then from grey Iona's granite girdled shore to tame the souls of rude rough-hearted men. No feeble race were they who chose to dwell in the green refuge of this wave-lashed nook, but strong in love and the all-conquering spell of death-defying cross and peaceful crook, and armed with law divine more strong than steel to bend the staff and make the proud man kneel. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nine Noted Chiefs of MacLean by Professor John Stuart Blackie Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould When the King of Norway came, our Alexander's crown to claim at Largs, with pomp and pride there, 
Gil McGlain seized the villain and drowned him in the Clyde there. Red Hector slew, I tell you true, the Laird of Drum and all his crew, at Harlaw on the heather there. But there the slain the slayer slew, and both lay dead together there. At Flodden Field stout Hector stood with all the best of Scottish blood, till swooping ruin found him there. And man for man his faithful clan were heaped in death around him there. Big Lachlan from his rocky hold right wisely ruled his clansmen bold that owned the stout command there, but stained with gore green Islay shore cut down by traitor hand there. At Inverlochy on the foes Sir Lachlan rained a shower of blows, a true and loyal knight there, while false Argyle removed a mile, looked on, and then took flight there. Sir Hector Roy, the stout Maclean, fought one to ten, but all in vain, his broad claymore unsheathing, himself lay dead mid heaps of slain for Charles at Inverkeething. O good Sir John, hadst thou been wise to read the times with prophet eyes, nor prop the falling Stuart then, the false Argyle with all his wile had not set foot endured then. On dark Culloden's bloody heath, Drimnan's claymore leaped from its sheath, Prince Charlie to deliver there. But vain the fight, in pitchy night his star went down forever there. When Lachlan's soul to Ifrin sped, the fiends below rejoiced and said, If Satan should resign here, this bad Maclean in hell shall reign, and drink red blood for wine here. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. War Song of Lachlan, High Chief of Maclean, translated from the Gaelic by Sir Walter Scott, read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. A weary month has wandered o'er since last we parted on the shore. Heaven, that I saw thee, love, once more safe on that shore again. "'Twas valiant Lachlan gave the word, Lachlan of many a galley lord. He called his kindred bands on board and launched them on the main. Clan Gillian is to ocean gone, Clan Gillian fierce and foray known, rejoicing in the glory won in many a bloody broil. For wide is heard the thundering fray, the rout, the ruin, the dismay, when from the twilight glens away Clan Gillian drives the spoil. Woe to the hills that shall rebound our bannered bagpipes' maddening sound. Clan Gillian's onset echoing round shall shake their inmost cell. Woe to the bark whose crew shall gaze where Lachlan's silken streamer plays. The fools might face the lightning's blaze as wisely and as well. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cornac on Sir Loch, Chief of Maclean, translated from the Gaelic by Sir Walter Scott, read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. Which of all the Senechies can trace thy line from the root up to Paradise, but Macbury, the son of Fergus? No sooner had thine ancient, stately tree taken firm hold in Albion than one of thy forefathers fell at Harlaw. "'Twas then we lost a chief of deathless name. "'Tis no base weed, no planted tree, "'nor a seedling of last autumn, "'nor a sapling planted at Beltane. "'Wide, wide around were spread its lofty branches, "'but the topmost bough is lowly laid. "'Thou hast forsaken us before Sawain. "'Thy dwelling is the winter-house, "'loud, sad, sad and mighty is thy death-song. O courteous champion of Montrose, O stately warrior of the Celtic Isles, thou shalt buckle thy harness on no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lady of Dewart's Vengeance by Charles Mackay. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. Weird woman that dwellest on lofty Ben Moor, Give ear to my sorrow, and aid I implore. 
A lady has come from the green sunny bowers of a far southern clime to the mountains of ours. A light in her eyes, but deceit in her heart, and she lingers and lingers and will not depart. Through darkness and danger, mid tempest and rain, she has sailed to our shores from the vineyards of Spain, forsaking her country, her kindred, her home, abroad through our cold western islands to roam, to find a young lover as fair to her side as a vision she saw in the slumbers of night. And hither by stars inauspicious conveyed, she has come, in her gems and her beauty arrayed, with a tongue full of sweetness, a heart insincere, and fixed her bright eyes on the chief of Maclean, to toy with his heart, and bewilder his brain. And I, who was once the delight of his soul, ere she like a blight on my happiness stole, now wander through Duart, neglected and lorn, of a stranger the scoff, of my maidens the scorn, with a grief in my bosom that gnaws at the core, and a fire in my brain that will burn evermore. Unless thou wilt aid me with charm and with spell to gain back the heart I have cherished so well, and rid me of her who with art the most vile has poisoned my peace with her glozing and guile, I hate her, with hatred intense as despair, it murders a guilt that my soul cannot bear. Be calm, craven spirit, on me be the guilt. No poison shall rack her, no blood shall be spilt, till my hair has turned gray and my blood has grown thin. I have dwelt on Ben more with the spirits of sin, and have learned by their aid without weapons to kill, and can blast by a look, and destroy by my will. With a good ship the Florida far on the seas, I'd whirl her and toss her like chaff on the breeze, and far on some cliff where the storms ever roar, and aid could not reach them, I'd drive them ashore, and the wanton I'd seize by her long raven locks and drag her to death at the foot of the rocks. But safe from all danger of winds and of tides, in calm Tobermory at anchor she rides. But peril may come mid security deep, and vengeance may wake when the world is asleep, and strong though her timbers, her haven secure, the hand of revenge, though unseen, shall be sure. Serene was the night, and unruffled the bay, not a breath stirred the deep where the Florida lay, her broad azure pendant hung breezeless on high, and her thin taper masts pointed clear to the sky. And the moonlight that fell on the breast of the deep appeared like the charm that had lulled it to sleep. The cabin boy dreamed of the vineyards of Spain, or roamed with a maiden at sunset again. The sailor in fancy was dancing afar in his own native land to his graceful guitar. Or blessed with a household, in sleep was restored to the children he loved, and the wife he adored. The fair Spanish lady in visions was blessed. She dreamed that escaped from the isles of the west, her young highland chief had consented to roam to her far Andalusia in search of a home, that together they dwelt in her own sunny clime where life was no effort and love was not crime. None dreamed of the danger that round them might lurk, but in darkness and silence a spell was at work. Concealed in the waters, at poop and at prow, the agents of evil were busy below, and noiseless their labor, but certain their stroke, through her strong carpet hull and her timbers of oak. And long ere the morning a loud sudden shriek was heard o'er the bay, Sprung a leak! Sprung a leak! Oh, then there was gathering in tumult and fear, and a blanching of cheeks as the peril grew near, a screaming of women, a shouting of men, and a rushing and trampling again and again. No time for leave-taking, no leisure to weep. In rolled the fierce waters, and down to the deep, down, down, fifty fathoms with captain and crew, the Florida sank, with the haven in view. Down, down to the bottom, escaping but one, to tell the sad tale of the deed that was done. And he, as he battled for life with the tide, beheld the fair lady of Spain by his side and a lank skinny hand that came up through the spray, and twined in her tresses as floating she lay. 
and heard the loud laughter of fiends in the air as she sank mid the waves with a shriek of despair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Burial of Sir Lachlan Moore MacLean by Thomas Pattison Slowly from the field of slaughter do they bring Sir Lachlan Moore, slowly o'er the wearied moorland from the damp and deadly shore. Slowly and in bitter sorrow through a rough and rugged way, with the yellow beams upon it of the sickly setting day. Ah, how lowly lies the leader, see how pale his face is now. Never in the hall or highway, never on the mountain brow, shall his step be laid majestic, shall his stately form be seen, shall his voice inspire the counsel or the fight his manly mien. Never shall his clan behind him gather in the joy of fight, never draw their cold blue weapons, hard and deadly glancing bright. Poorly now's the chief attended, rudely now the heroes led, yet he wakes not from the slumber of yon red and mossy bed. For the sad stamps on his feature, which Dubshee's hard arrow bore, on the moor Clan Gillian reddened with their brave and boiling gore. Only two are with the driver on a rolling, rocking car, stretched whereon the dead man's carried from the fiery field of war. Two that walk in silent sorrow, ladies of his kindred are, mourning to the field of slaughter, come to seek him from afar. As they drive him slowly onward o'er the bad and broken way, his head with all its matted tresses nodded where he lifeless lay. Then the driver laughed who saw him, large and massy lie along, senseless, soulless, him so lately foremost in the martial throng. Laughed, and quicker drove him onward yet again to see the head nodding without will or reason with its light of manhood fled. Nodding at the boar who jeered him with that mean malicious scorn, nursed in secret by the envy and the vulgar spirit born. Then the ladies hastened forward. Not a word the younger said, while the tears rained down in anguish on the wan face of the dead. But the elder damsel answered, Laughst thou at my fallen chief? May thy own vile carcass caitiff fill thy mother's heart with grief. Out she drew the chieftain's dagger, as she hurled this angry cry at the boar who gloomed before her with his dull and threatening eye. And she struck him down and left him stretched beneath the sunbeams there like a wild fowl by the falcon swept from out the fields of air. Then alone their dead they carried, while one nursed the manly brow, nursed it on her bosom gently like a holy, heavenly vow. And one, tenderly she drove him to the sad and solemn ground, where the hero's dust reposes with the moldering ashes round. Soft and slowly there we leave them, Chieftain, may thine ashes rest, peaceful as the voice of prayer from a calm, untroubled breast. Long as sound the breezes o'er them, sound the voice of psalms beside, and spread Christ's peace-speaking gospel from thy green sod, far and wide. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Battle of Knockbreak Original by Phillips of Amercloss, translated by Unknown, read for LibriVox by Philip Gould. Meantime Lochbuoy from the stormy isle of warlike Mull advanced to join Dundee. Three hundred brave Maclean's composed his train, a generous loyal clan whose faithful blood untainted filled his veins. Quick he marched along the banks of Spey in silence of the night, the royal camp unknown, a stranger he, and unacquainted with the gloomy shade, upon a hostile troop of Belgic horse, the advanced guard whom he believed his friends erroneous fell. Stop! the horse sentry bawled in horrid Dutch, and straight upon them fired. The rest alarmed, a thundering peal of shot discharged and tore the air with fire and smoke. The brave Maclean's their compliment returned and scattered flaming death among the foe. 
then forming in a wedge their thickest lines they pierced and through the furious squadron broke with sword in hand nor halted they until they gained a neighboring eminence a rock whose frowning top amid the clouds concealed showed all its battered sides with rugged stones and fragments huge perplexed and took its name from blood which their impervious surface stained where as with ramparts fenced secure they lodged superior to the foe thither in haste and with collected strength of different lands germans dutch english rebel scots and danes the adverse troop pursue oft did they aim with fire and sword to storm the rugged camp but all in vain with spears and darts and stones and rocks which tumbling down with hideous din o'erwhelmed both horse and man they headlong drove the insulting foe who with their mangled limbs and brains and bloods the ragged flints besmeared their leader daring haughty fierce and proud in war delighted and with keenest rage his foe pursued great britain's southern shore his boasted climb the english horse and rough batavian troops his stern command obeyed his shining neck a golden collar graced and from his shoulder hung a scarlet sash or a purple robe conspicuous far with golden lace and rich embroidery shone enraged to see his baffled troops repelled and scattered amongst the rocks their mangled limbs he gnashed his teeth and mad with fury bawled come down ye thieves you barbarous crew descend and on the equal plain your courage prove nor lurk behind those rocks if ye be men then as if impelled by rage of all delay impatient furious he commands his troops the precipice to gain and drive them down or leave their battered carcasses a prey to wolves and dogs and fearless leads them on but undismayed the brave maclean's beheld the audacious foe and with firm hearts resolved by manly deeds to answer boasting vain and quick as thought to his unerring eye his thundering peace a warrior bold applied whence as from fate a whizzing bullet flew with fire and sulphur winged and at the mouth of the proud boaster entering pierced his lungs with rapid force and at his back its passage made down to the earth he fell and rolling round his languid eyes his soul forth issuing with his blood dissolved in air end of poem this recording is in the public domain maclean's welcome to prince charlie author unknown read for librivox dot org by philip gould come o'er the stream charlie dear charlie brave charlie come o'er the stream charlie and dine with maclean and though you be weary we'll make your heart cheery and welcome our charlie and his loyal train we'll bring down the track dear we'll bring down the black steer the lamb from the bracken the doe from the glen the salt sea will harry and bring to our charlie the cream from the brothy and curd from the pen come o'er the stream charlie dear charlie brave charlie come o'er the stream charlie and dine with maclean and though you be weary we'll make your heart cheery and welcome our charlie and his loyal train and yon shall drink freely the dews of glenshearley the stream is the starlight when kings do not ken and deep be your mead of the wine that is red to drink to your sire and his friend the maclean come o'er the stream charlie dear charlie brave charlie come o'er the stream charlie and dine with maclean and though you be weary we'll make your heart cheery and welcome our charlie and his loyal train or heath bells shall trace you the maids to embrace you and deck your blue bonnet with flowers of the bray and the loveliest mary in all glen macquarie shall lie in your bosom till break of the day come o'er the stream charlie dear charlie brave charlie come o'er the stream charlie and dine with maclean and though you be weary we'll make your heart cheery and welcome our charlie and his loyal train if aught will invite you or more will delight you tis ready a troop of our bold highland men shall range on the heather with bonnet and feather strong arms and broad claymores three hundred and ten come o'er the stream charlie dear charlie brave charlie come o'er the stream charlie and dine with maclean and though you be weary we'll make your heart cheery and welcome our charlie and his loyal train end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Gathering of the Clan by Mary Ross Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould Banners are waving o'er Morvern's dark heath, Claymores are flashing from many a sheath. Hark! tis the gathering, on, onward they cry, Far flies the signal to conquer or die. Then follow thee, follow, a boat to the sea, Thy prince in Glenmoidart is waiting for thee, Where war-pipes are sounding and banners are free, MacLean and his clansmen the foremost you'll see. Wildly the war-cry has startled yon stag, And wakened the echoes of Gillian's lone crag. Up hill and down glen each brave mountaineer Has belted his plaid and mounted his spear. Then follow thee, follow, a boat to the sea, Thy prince in Glenmoidart is waiting for thee. Where war-pipes are sounding and banners are free, MacLean and his clansmen the foremost you'll see. The signal is heard from mountain to shore, They rush like the flood over dark Corrivore. The war-note is sounding loud wildly and high, Louder they shout, On, to conquer or die. Then follow thee, follow, a boat to the sea, Thy prince in Glenmoidart is waiting for thee. Where war-pipes are sounding and banners are free, MacLean and his clansmen the foremost you'll see. The heath-bell at morn so proudly ye trod, Son of the mountain now covers thy sod, Wrapped in your plaid mid the bravest ye lie, The words as ye fell still to conquer or die. Then follow thee, follow, a boat to the sea, Thy prince in Glenmoidart is waiting for thee, Where war-pipes are sounding and banners are free, MacLean and his clansmen the foremost you'll see. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Isle of Inish Choinich by Dr. Samuel Johnson Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould Scarce spied amidst the West Sea foam, yet once religion's chosen home, Appears the isle whose savage race By Kenneth's voice was won to grace. O'er glassy tides I thither flew The wonders of the spot to view. In lonely cottage great MacLean Held his high ancestral reign With daughters fair whom love might deem The naiads of the ocean stream. Yet not in chilly cavern rude were they Like Danube's lawless But all that charms a polished age, The tuneful lyre, the learned page combined to beautify and bless that life of ease and loneliness. Now dawned the day whose holy light puts human hopes and cares to flight, nor mid the hoarse waves circling swell did worship here forget to dwell. What, though beneath a woman's hand the sacred volume's leaves expand, no need of priestly sanction there, the sinless heart makes holy prayer. Then wherefore further seek to rove, while all is here our hearts approve, repose, security, and love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Lay of Clan MacLean, Author Unknown Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould Prologue with pen and ink and eck pen-wiper, A clerk would fain indite a song. He would, he were a highland piper, To blow a bagpipe loud and long. About the clan MacLean of Duart, The Archies, Lachlan's, Hughes, and Johns, As good a clan as Royal Stuart, And better than the German Vons. The clerk himself is come of Japhet, Though neither Mac nor Vaughn he be, in ancestry there's naught to laugh at, Who mocks, no grandfather had he. The men who venerate their fathers Desire their sons should do the same. Tis thus a race its essence gathers, Tis thus ennobled as a name. Song The isles that stud the stormy waters Of Caledonia's rugged strands Send warlike sons and gentle daughters To brace the blood of tamer lands. They leave the islands of the far west, the cradle of the iron gale, for scanty is the highland harvest, too many mouths, too little kale. No purple grapes but oats and barley give nerve and blood to the Maclean's, yet loyal blood that flowed for Charlie still circles in their children's veins. Their fathers supped oatmeal and whiskey, their beds were made of fragrant heath, their heads were cool. 
their legs were frisky, their hearts like fires, the plaids beneath. Their limbs were free in nature's leather, as Greeks rejoiced their gods to mold. The Phrygian cap with eagle's feather adorned the head and braved the cold. The kilt, the tunic of the Roman, the plaid, the drapery of the Greek. When were such sons of mortal woman whose very dress had tongues to speak? Heroic men in vain one preaches, the prosy race of moderns find. Tis decenter to wear the breeches, a tile and coat with tails behind. But fancy Staffa's glorious columns draped with the creepers of Sula, a highlander in what you columns, the things his fathers never knew. But never mind, you'll always find him as warm in heart, as leal in bone. He graced the kilt he leaves behind him, he honors what he now puts on. They leave the land of somber beauty, of mountains, rock, and sandy shore, but full of love, of faith, and duty, where'er they go they love it more. Dear land, though o'er thy hills the heaven may lack Morea's lustrous skies, to thee a freedom has been given, which in yon dazzling climate dies. As these gray hills of rock and heather draw down the clouds in misty rain, so draw them by a mystic tether, the exiled highland heart again. Their memory warms at old tradition of Mull and Call and dark Lismore, old Fingal deeds, Columba's mission, the Duart towns and Arrow shore. How proud are they of clannish tartan, how dear to them the bonnet blue, the Gael's descendants set their heart on the colors of their fathers true. In later, as in older story, of battlefield the clan MacLean has borne a greater share of glory than tamer races of the plain. Schooled as of old the warrior Spartan to live and die for home and fame, with steel and blood these men in tartan on honor's shield have graved a name. In war MacLean is brave in battle, in peace a credit to his clan, in office trade or feeding cattle in love or friendship he's your man then blow the pibroch o'er the waters we'll dance a reel with might and main long live the name the sons and daughters at home abroad of clan mclean end of poem this recording is in the public domain